Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Food for Thought Monday, 7th noon lecture. We start with a land acknowledgement. The University of Manitoba campuses are located on original lands of Anishinaabe, Cree, Ochi Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Medes nation. We respect the treaties that were made on these territories. We acknowledge the, the harms and mistakes of the past, and we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. First, special thanks to Brandy and Michaela again for working with and for us with cheerfulness and superb professionalism. And I would like to introduce our speaker today. Before founding the Landscape Architecture and Planning Studio Ruderal, Sarah Cowles was an assistant professor of landscape architecture at Norton School at The Ohio State University and Associate Professor of Practice at the University of Southern California. She decided to leave the Ivy Tower and take roots in a new habitat. Ruderal, from Latin ruderalis, rudus, rubble, or German should. Ruderal sites are places profoundly disturbed by human activities. Their previous vegetation is destroyed, the soil structure altered, and living conditions deviate from the original conditions. From an evolutionary point of view, rural sites are of novel appearance. Therefore, relatively few plant species originate from these areas. Most rural species migrated from unique habitats of a primeval, primeval landscape or other climate zones. Our guest presenter today found her new habitat in Georgia. The country boasts of being one of the oldest wine growing regions globally. Viniculture dates back to approximately 8,000 years. The country delivers 22 million bulbs of Galantus nivalis, snowdrops, to traders in the Netherlands every year. Snowdrops grow in the forests and most of them are picked in the wild. Something we have in common here in Manitoba and there in Georgia in certain regions like the little Caucasus, the dry air makes the snow fluffy and beautiful. Sarah Cowles presents from the capital of this beautiful country. I'm not talking about Atlanta. So Sarah is in Tiflis or Tbilisi. Tbilisi means the warm city. I am more than curious to hear why she decided to look for new growing conditions, but I can announce that the projects we will see in a few seconds are adventurous, risky, and daring. They go beyond established standards and routines in landscape architecture. So welcome, Sarah. Thank you, Dithmar. Thank you so much for that, that <laughs> wonderful introduction. And, and um, yeah, absolutely the most poetic description of, of Ruderal. Um, so I, yeah, I, today I'm going to introduce some of the research work that I was involved in when I was a professor. And then I'll introduce um, how the studio started, some of the people in the studio, and then I'll go into several projects that I'm currently working on, including our soul oasis. And I may have to take one second and make sure that my dog can get out. <laughs> so just give me one moment. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much for your patience. It's a little late, a little late here. So I'm in um, four hours ahead of London time here. Let's see if I can do this. Um, <clears throat> so, as I mentioned, I will speak a bit about the origins of the practice, um, which most, more or less, the um, research I started was in Columbus, Ohio, at the Ohio State University, and I was biking around the edges of the city and finding all these wonderful um, rural landscapes, including salt stockpiles and old rail yards and such. Um, and this is a drawing of one of these stockpiles that needs road salt. Um, and they cover in the winter with um, plastic. And um, sort of three ideas of sort of nature, disturbed nature, the sort of undisturbed nature here is nature, nature one. And um, the functional disturbed is maybe kind of like channelized condition and engineered, hard engineered condition. And then this third one is sort of where we break those, that down and we break down some of the hard edges of things and um, what we call the kind of dysfunctional but different. And these are places that um, I definitely, we definitely find a lot of our work in those areas where some systems been disrupted, broken, repaired, and such. And so in this case, um, we were studying this pile of salt that would, um, would be the salt runoff that would um, flow into some of the local uh, storm water systems, which of course is quite terrible for all living things. And so in studying this landscape, we, we were looking at what kinds of plants were adapted to this very saline condition in the city. And also what could we do with this saline runoff because it's actually quite, quite beautiful. So um, this is an overview of what that looks like, form a former rail yard. Um, you can see the pattern of the roundhouse. Um, there's some distribution areas there and highways. And Columbus used to be a big, big, big rail city. Um, it's no longer. And in this view, you can see where the stockpile is and um, the rural vegetation patches. And there's, you can see how they're kind of growing within the tracks uh, of the old roundhouse. You see these kind of patterns throughout the world. You know, Germany's got a lot of great parks that are and former rail yards. And so the current condition is that the water runs off, um, carries the salt into that channel, which then goes into the uh, Olentangy and Sayuro rivers. And so we thought rather than kind of just a sort of straight ahead detention and cleanup, perhaps there's something we can do in order to capture the beauty of this crystallization. Um, by very subtle changes in the topography, and then also integrating that um, salt-adapted vegetation. And so this is the kind of ideogram of the project. Uh, and so you can see there's you know, great contrast, there's all kinds of tipping piles and such, of asphalt, and um, this is the kind of salty condition <laughs> that you have. And you can see how the, how the saline water is sort of deposits itself, um, in these different patterns as it's flowing through the site. Um, and this is our team that was doing research that summer. And so this is this is that beautiful um, fractional crystallization that is this yellow and the blue um, that flows across the asphalt. So we're thinking about you know, how do we, rather than just doing like a cleanup or a rehabilitation that would mask this um, quite sublime condition, like how can we work with these forces of the, the runoff. Um, also, these just absolutely wonderful patterns um, throughout the site. And one of the artists that we looked at um, as a reference that I got turned on to when I was in art school uh, is Barry Lavaugh. Uh, and he worked a lot with, you know, pouring and blowing materials, different types of pigments, throwing things across, across the field. So this idea of field conditions, materials, movement, energy, and armature is really significant in, um, in his work. And, and I've adapted that in many ways to working in landscape. And so we, we began with, you know, creating these kind of armature models and using different processes of, you know, blowing graphite or like spraying on glue and seeing how, you know, how we might channel and uh, distribute these different types of, you know, granular materials and seeds. Um, and these are 
um, more detailed sectional drawings, it's kind of analysis of the site and looking at the, the compaction of the soil where the rail, the rail yard was and how the rural vegetation could kind of take root in some areas where it's less compacted. And then that, of course, like sublime icon of this mountain and, you know, Columbus is just a very flat place. And so this is <laughs> the only relief there. Um, another um, project that was a big influence is, and I'm going to butcher this German, um, Schoenberg Sugeland in Berlin, which is um, also a former rail yard that's managed um, in a kind of different time, set of time cycles. So certain, um, certain areas are mown more often than others. Some things are just left aside. And so these temporal processes of mowing and mowing and cutting, disturbing and, and such are become the spatial structure of, of the park itself. And that is how that is how the um how people can read the change over time and it creates more habitat. And so this is another adaptation of a, a drawing of a diagram that's in um this wonderful um, I don't know if the book is still available. This is um by Lucia, Lucia Gross Bachley and her um, diagramming of those, again, those processes that are reset quite often, those that are reset maybe every month or so, and then ones that are reset every year, and then those that happen maybe never. <laughs> um, and so these ideas of feedback are really important, disturbance and feedback and disturbance and feedback and intervention, kind of scripting gets involved in these projects. So. We started sketching some kind of typical conditions of um, of these landscapes and how we might model them, um, and looking at the, again those flows of the flows of salt water, the flows of fresh water, how those might be you know channeled in different ways. So you have different biotic conditions depending on the adaptation to the salinity in the water, um, and then we we model those in rhino um, and then milled them into these little um, like blanks, I guess we would call them. And so for each condition on the site, we had five phases. Um, and we started with the same model blank, and then we used hand tools and other types of um, modeling techniques to show the cycles of disturbance and response. Um, and that's what these start to look like. These are a bit of a hybrid between the hand the hand models and then some Photoshop. We never, we didn't get quite get around to playing with the salt with them, but the idea um ways we might impound the water in certain times and then take that impoundment away all of this is very interesting because it really i didn't know that 10 years later i'd be building really actually a similar project so it gives you an idea again of the, the sort of foundations of how um how rural the practice ended up um going in the direction that it's it's gone in um and so this is this next section, I'll just talk briefly about how we established the studio. And I, I had been working in Georgia. Um, that project that I just showed was the first project I ever exhibited in Georgia. And that was about 10 years ago. I met a bunch of amazing people and the landscape was just quite enchanting. Um, so many different types of landscape conditions, everything from desert to subtropical to alpine and really amazing landscapes in between. Um, these are caucuses or quite fantastic and then and in you know a, a very um deep reservoir of endemic species um that people really don't know much about although as you mentioned like many of them are exported um and grown in the netherlands also the basic christmas tree that we all know and love um comes from georgia and so our, currently our team um we're about five we're growing <laughs> um and the so the key people who started it is um, Ben Hackenberger, uh, Georgi Dishnanidze, and myself. Um, and I, I started it and started, you know, like at the snowball, it just keeps gathering snow. Um, David Mombaladze, who um, former ski instructor, now landscape um, coordinator, and Ethan Dishnanidze. Um, and as I mentioned, yeah, we're we're constantly looking for new people, and there are no landscape architecture programs in Georgia, so. We're basically bringing in artists and architects who have an interest in urban ecology, and um, and mostly it's really about um, creating a kind of community and family around.
around around these ideas. And so as you, if you don't know where Georgia is between the Black and the Caspian Seas, um, just south of, of Russia and north of Turkey, sandwiched between a lot of interesting places, Armenia, Azerbaijan. And so you have, you know, very different, very different um, ecosystems beyond the Caucasus um, as well, that it really makes it just such an interesting, a really, really interesting place, you know, geologically, politically. Um, it's quite, <laughs> quite a dense place to be right now. And our projects uh, mainly center on um, the East um, in an area called Kafeti, as Igmar mentioned, that's the main, the main wine growing area. The wine is grown all over at many different altitudes and at growing conditions. Um, wine grapes excuse me um Tbilisi, which is the capital um which is really historically an armenian city um but has really become majority georgian um and then in the lesser caucasus borjomi and a kind of belt of health resorts that um were all built during the soviet era and so uh georgia is quite quite important and on the map in terms of probably the 21st century, in terms of relinking Asia and Europe on different land routes, as well as across the Caspian and Black Seas. Um, and there is a huge divide. So there's a north-south divide in terms of mountains. Um, this is one of the things that's kept um, different invading invading groups out um, over time and sometimes has let them in and then in the in the center sort of in the the west center there's a pass between east and west georgia which is they're completely different um in terms of climate um the uh, black sea side is much wetter than um the caspian side and languages there's some subgroups of languages that are um completely unrelated as well as um in the south some of those there's turkish and uh, armenian influence on, on language and then of course to the north is russian um there's a port on the sea as well um poti and batumi so ajar and ajar the ajar mountains is a really fascinating place that i want to spend more time in um so this um the kind of interesting context that we're in in terms of landscape right now is that the Asia Development Bank is funding a lot of um, a lot of transport projects and urban redevelopment projects, uh, a lot of um, equality and access projects. So, making the subways metro accessible, uh, making parks accessible, improving the parks, but uh, a lot of building roads. And so, right now we are completely renovating the East West Highway as well as the rail. So the current project is this massive one that um, is 96 bridges and 53 tunnels. It'll cut the transit time by about two hours. Right now it's a very, very hairball road, as we would say, it's quite dangerous. Um, and you can see the kind of impact that this construction has on that um, very, very high relief landscape. So it'll it'll be a much safer road, it'll be a faster road, but, um, as you can see in this in this photo, there's going to be a lot of sediment ending up in this in um, in these rivers. Um, and there's just you know massive camps of workers. There, uh, almost all of this is being built by Chinese companies, um, which is fairly common throughout these Belt and Road projects. So we got our drone out, and flew it over one time. We were going to Batumi. So. Moving back to the, the uh, capital, Tbilisi, where our studio is located and we live, you can see in this um, in this map, 19th century map, there were a huge amount of gardens. Um, and, and, and the city is really in this tight canyon. There's mountains on both sides, quite steep mountains. Um, and over time, all these green areas that you see have been quite built up. I was, um, it's been really interesting to study some in this, this bottom area with this Get to see this um, circular island that's called Artichala. Um, that used to be a huge pleasure ground. Um, and then in the in sort of the northwest corner, um, it was more of a German district. So um, yeah, it's been quite built up since then. Um, you can see here, this is the main river that flows through the city, the Quari or Kura, 
which starts in Turkey and flows into the Caspian Sea. Um, you can see our lovely TV tower in the mountain is called Tatsminda, basically Holy Mountain. And I'll show some work from um, our work on forestation of that. Um, and then the, the neighborhood in the foreground is called Ablabari, which is historically an Armenian um, enclave. And in the, and sort of moving back into that other canyon that's called Sololaki, which basically means ditch. And that was um, one of the first areas that was irrigated in the city. Um, so we work primarily, um, as I mentioned, with endemic species in our projects in Georgia. And this is uh, seedlings that are being grown um, in Sartichala, which is about a 20 minutes outside of the city. It's been a huge investment in this, which is really exciting. Um, we're working closely with the forester um, and his team um, to start promoting the use of these species. There's a whole lot of a forestation that needs to happen as well as we'll hopefully be starting um, um, propagating more herbaceous species that we can use in our in our projects. So this is really exciting and expanding. Um, his team goes up to the mountains and you know shakes seeds out of climbs up cliffs and shakes seeds out of trees. Um, it's quite a fantastic place. We have some drone footage of that here. But this is basically the only place that's operating at um, that's doing this kind of work at a huge scale. So our, one of our biggest problems is supply chain, um, just supplies. We, um, the, the kind of typical landscape or greening um, economy here is all, it's all imported trees and shrubs from Turkey uh, and Spain and Italy. And so there's really no, uh, there's no local, like large scale propagation of landscape plants other than this Tartatala um, nursery, which is really focused on uh, endemics and what they would call bunavrivi or natural. <laughs> um, and so another part of our practice besides that is, is basically drawing and getting to know getting to know the landscape through looking at it for a long time <laughs> and starting to understand like what are the, you know what is what are the subtle changes on the topography the textures how does light play um, on these you know plateaus and um, sort of what are the bigger gestures of the landscape which is um, I think a really important thing for anyone to do um, to really get an idea of like how how you might begin to contrast or complement or work within your context. Um, this is, as I mentioned, this is the mountains in Ajara. The previous one was Kartli, uh, Kartli kind of the steppe. It's more Mesopotamian. And um, this is Upper Alpine. This is right on the border of Turkey. This is actually a ski area, um, but it has this amazing prismatic light. So I, I got to spend some time up there one summer just drawing. Uh, we also work, um, we also work from this idea of lexicon and rather than kind of a um, rather than a program first way of working. And so um, what I like is, you know, is when I was teaching, I would always I'd always ask students to start with the landscape first, with the idea of the landscape first, and then fit the program into that landscape. You know, what's your landscape idea? And one of the things that we have been working with and training some of the people who come into the studio is to get them to go out and identify what these kind of landscape patterns are and, and build up that lexicon. So is it, you know, what does the edge of the field look like in Georgia? And there's a number of painters that we look at um, that I don't remember if I put them in this presentation, hopefully I did, um, because they really get at the, you know, spatial, the spatial quality and the texture. Um, so we build these lexicon models um, in other work that when I was teaching, we would then with the students uh, look at ways that those might evolve over time. Um, you know, five years, 30 years with different manipulation of topography or how, you know, new plantings might emerge, um, woodlots, hedgerows, that kind of thing. And then how do they all add up into, um, into an existing landscape. So if we insert insert these different, you know, elements or lex lexicon elements or build up and amplify the kind of patterns. And a lot of this, um, a lot of this work is really highly influenced by Michelle Devine, who I taught with for one year. Um, 
at Ohio State. And um, so we sort of built together um, <clears throat> these ideas, thought about adapting them to American conditions. And this this larger scale way of looking at landscape is, is really critical to how we're working in Georgia. Um, Here's a picture of our studio. Um, as you can see, we have a nice big table for drawing. We have our usual collection of artifacts <laughs> and things um, that we find. And then, um, yeah, various people come in in the summer and we're always happy to host people um, who want to come explore and we can find you a good place to stay and give you some things to go look at and um, come back and draw some things and talk to us about it. Um, we don't necessarily have <laughs> we don't have really formal internships at this point just because we're just not in a, a place where we can where we can do that but, um we definitely host people who want to just find a place um you know just figure out where to go explore and it's really inexpensive um to do that in georgia so <clears throat> our first built project um once we once we established the studio, it was the Arsenal Oasis, which we did for the uh, Architecture Biennial. We were selected as one of the teams. In this in this drone photo, you can see our excavator that we just hired off the street, which is one of the other great things you can do in Georgia. It's, <laughs> any heavy equipment you want, there's a guy and there's a phone number. You just tell him where to go, and it, it'll be you know sixty bucks for the day. So <laughs> we brought this guy there. Um, so this was the theme of of the. Um, the biennial, what do we have in common? And again, this was Corona time. So, you know, this wasn't gonna be a big get together. It was gonna be mostly online. Um, so they really adapted that format, uh, but we did fortunately get a site project to work, work with. And the foundation of the, of the Arsenal Oasis project came from an idea of how do we, how can we do the sort of restitution of all the lost spaces um, of the city, which, you know, during, during the sort of era of, of like lawlessness, civil war, privatization in the nineties, the city um, the city sold off a lot of land or people just sold off a lot of, a lot of land. And I'll show, I'll show some examples a little later. The, the Soviets were really good at planning for having a lot of outdoor space around these towers and what they call micro rayons. And uh, the city had these incredible sort of green belts, um, which helped keep the um, keep the city cool, have the airflow, um, <clears throat> provided a lot of places for people to play, kids to play, and all of those got filled in during um, the past thirty years. Um, and you can see here, this is a protest where someone in the city sold off part of this main park, Bucky Park, which is right in the center of town to some developer to build to build a hotel. And they started digging a hole and people came around and said, what's going on? Anyway, they managed to stop this project, but there's still a huge hole in the ground um, six years later. Uh, so there's a really strong activist culture in the city and really effective, but also nobody has the kind of landscape architecture, urban design training to show what that alternative is. Like, what do we want? Like, if the mayor gives us the space back, what do we want instead of this hole, right? Because we can't have, <laughs> the park's not gonna come back quite yet. So um, <clears throat> these are more examples of kind of what the public realm, the degradation of the public realm looks like. Um, it's also a city that was not built for cars and now everybody has a car. They all come secondhand from US, Canada and Europe. and. Um, People park on the sidewalk, um, or there's construction that's happening that's very unregulated. I recently twisted my ankle in some kind of hole like this. You really have to look out for where you're going. A lot of this is changing. Um, it has started changing, but it's um, it's it's quite a lot. <laughs> um, and so this is some work that um, some of our colleagues in Canada have worked on, which is you know, more on the kind of granular level of how public space um, was sort of eaten away in the city. Um, this is um, the disappearance of a shared courtyard and basically quantifying that. And so one, one idea we had was to work with them to really get a, an idea of the sort of gross loss of public space in the city by just figuring out sort of what that loss was, you know, in each neighborhood by some factor or another. 
and and one of the areas that um we sort of skipped that step let's just say we skipped that step of doing the quantification because um we figured we'd get that later there's this huge um this huge swath of open space um in the city and Avlabari between um, where Avlabari Metro is. There was gonna be a metro here actually in this neighborhood called Svanatis Ubani. At the bottom, you can see the rail line. And this was this um, Russian army base that it was Soviet. And then when Georgia became independent in the nineties, the Ministry of um, Defense privatized it and its ownership is really unclear. Some people say that the current mayor owns it. Some people say somebody else owns it, but basically it's just wide open space. Um, here you can see the beginning is of those barracks. Um, again, one of these 19th century maps of the city. Um, and there's that Avlobari neighborhood there to the south. And you can see there's quite a bit of relief. Um, that moves up on this plateau and these two very significant ravines that run on each side of it. And then again, there you can see just how much green was in the city. So this is um, 1960 something, 65, um, where it's co completely covered with barracks, uh, munition storage. And then you can see those two ravines there. Um, there's a uh, church and a park. Um, on the left side of this image, this is now an enormous Orthodox cathedral that was um, built about 10 years ago um, by sort of the main patron of the country. His name is Gudzina Ivanishvili. Um, we'll hear about him again soon. Anyway, this is the current condition, right? So you can see from there to there, um, there's that huge cathedral. Um, and then this is the plateau they've removed all the barracks and there's mostly just the terraces and the concrete that's left. And it's really just a wild space. You know, people, people walk their dogs there, you know, they take their kids out and like shoot rabbits. There's people grazing sheep on it. Um, there's some really mean dogs at the bottom I've heard. Um, <laughs> so, and it has an incredible view of the city. Um, this is some drone footage and you can see there's those traces of those um, plantings the um the cypress and stuff um and also in this image you'll see that there's this little concentration um of bright green um and that that there is the broken pipe that's the weapon that was created by this broken water main which basically runs down the spine here so we follow that you could follow that water right down there so this was the aha moment for us um and this kind of um, ideogram sketch, which put together the two ideas of, you know, how can we, how could we take all these lost gardens of the city and kind of patch them back in to this landscape? And this is the kind of contemplative image of it. And on the right, you can see the on the ground condition in summer. Um, also, there's, you know, the usual amount of garbage just dumped everywhere. <laughs> Um, not sure, not sure what this practice is from. It's very common here. Even though there's trash pickup, people still like throwing things in what's called Feoba or ravine. Um, and you can see these, you know, iconic Soviet flats um, here on the horizon. Um, so generally the conditions are like this very dry, you know, step, <laughs> compacted rubble, and then the area where that has been irrigated by this broken pipe for probably eight, eight years now is this wonderful lush you know biodiverse habitat rich <laughs> um arsenal oasis and at the top of the um at the top where that you can see that broken pipe here um and somebody's put a little water bottle on top of it so it doesn't spray everywhere. This is kind of the main spring, right? This sort of man-made spring. Um, and as you can see in this image here, there's the Tatsmina mountain in, um, off in the distance. And so our initial our initial thought was to kind of just frame this landscape in a way. Um, I think maybe some of you have read this very famous essay that's called Messy Ecosystems Orderly Framed. And we decided this would be, um, messy frames 
and messy ecosystems <laughs> together. Um, and so we experimented a bit um, using collage, um, working on site, um, you know, kind of that whole like fear that you have when you have a project due and you're like, we don't have an idea yet. Like, what are we gonna do? And we went and we looked at this like enormous pieces of scrap metal that we couldn't get onto the site without a crane or um, there's another type of really common building material, which is a precast lab called Sinkare that's everywhere. We thought about using that. Um, eventually we had an idea of like, why don't we just make something that one human could carry? Which I'll show you in a minute. Um, and this is our reference site for that wetland, um, an actual um, naturally occurring wetland that's in the Santats Minda, about the same elevation. Um, and uh, I forget the name of the scientist who went to um, kind of inventoried um, the different species that are around this wetland. So naturally occurring wetland and man-made accident wetland, one of my favorites. So <laughs> as I mentioned, we we thought, okay, why don't we like divert this water, like cut into this lab in some way, and we we're going to just get somebody with a bobcat or a concrete saw and you know, nobody wanted to do it. And then we just got this guy who just, I don't know, like I said, $60. He came over and just started tearing up the slab of this foundation. And what's really interesting is the um, the aggregate in this concrete is cobble from the Mukhtwari River. So it's this beautiful round cobble, um, big cobblestone that you can see Ben is digging around in it. So you have this like displacement of the river up onto the plateau, which is quite wonderful. They built, also they built all the cobblestone roads um, on that plateau with that as well. So there's Georgi directing, directing traffic and Ben digging holes. And this is uh, Vardo, Georgi Vardashvili. He's <clears throat> directing our friend in the excavator to create some ditches to irrigate an orchard. Um, and then again, these are the, um, what we call the dog door. These are these panels um, that we had made by a local welder. And uh, yeah, again, the idea is like, can you carry it yourself, right? Like unload it from a truck and move it around. Um, it had to be kind of modular. And it, it's called a dog door because when I, <laughs> I brought my dog to Georgia and she came over in this big, crate and then I left the crate at someone's ranch and somebody stole the door and used it as a barbecue and I had to go get a <laughs> I had to go get a replacement made um at the kind of local materials bazaar that's called Eliawa. So one day I was like looking around I was like well maybe we just can use this dog door. So this welded frame with mesh became our <clears throat> our main kind of armature. And here's um Christian Moore he was working with us. He's an amazing plantsman. Um, he went back to work in Chicago. Um, but here we are creating that pool. Um, and here's something, you know, lovely and poetic talking, <laughs> talking about what this um, what this place means to us. And, and you know, not only does it have a really um, a wonderful sort of foreground um, sensibility to it um, as it evolves, um, and as we've intervened in it, it also is just this incredible place to have a prospect onto the city and to think about how does ecology fit into a modern city. And one of the one of the things that's been kind of the, the really difficult part about living in Hilisi is that the the local ecosystems are just non-existent. And like I mentioned before, we just have like imported lollipop trees from Italy and you know turkey and it's just a lot of like cherry laurel and potosporum and it's quite pathetic so our idea is like how can we you know tease the diversity of the georgian landscape back into the city <coughs> here you can see a drone image um, of that <coughs> excavated area and then we created some pillows you can hang out on and you can see how that water irrigates some of the other areas and it creates this wonderful um spectrum 
<clears throat> and when the light hits it just right, this other broken pipe here. And this is a diagram showing the um, different locations of the pipe, and how the water, um, how we've diverted the water over time. <clears throat> And this unfortunately is rotated. Sorry, I did that horrible thing that people are not supposed to do, not supposed to do which is rotate the orientation of the plant. Uh, but this shows some of the other areas that we planted over time, um, different successes and failures in there, um, and a model. How did this one get rotated too? Oh my God, I'm getting a very bad grade for this. Uh, <clears throat> So here we are, at the, this was the opening, which was just a terrible cold and gray day, unfortunately. We also had some friends who cast um, stepping stones out of those, uh, you know, those tubes that you use for columns. Uh, we just had those sliced up um, through some uh, armature inside of them. And um, these have become really, really fun. They get rolled all over the site by different people. <laughs> <clears throat> and rearranged. <clears throat> so one experiment we tried to do was one of these Miyawaki tiny forests using endemic species. Um, and this was an absolute disaster. Um, it got eaten by sheep, it got burned, and then it just died from drought. <laughs> so... Um, but we really had good intentions to create a, um, a little hardwood forest. Um, we're going to try again this year, I think. Um, and this is a wonderful collage that uh, Christian made uh, showing the different types of <clears throat> rural species that are on the site, all the wonderful colors and textures that you see. Um, and these, um, these trees have actually done really well. We're really happy and the willow, we, we put a whole lot of willow um, cuttings in, in these ponds and those have just completely taken off. They were a huge surprise. This was us trying to plant that Miyawaki tiny forest. We had one of those um, motorized augers that that was really an essential tool. We had we bought a few tools for this. We bought a chainsaw, an auger and a really scary weed whacker that has a blade. So like I mentioned, there was a fire. Um, some kids were barbecuing or something and that was an uncontrolled burn. <coughs> we took some drone photos of that. The extent of that, so you can see we lost quite a lot, but it came right back. There's our trees that got burned. <laughs> But next year, everything started to come back. That spring, a lot of tadpoles, um, thousands and thousands of frogs living there. And um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, there's um, this has really become a place where when people come visit, um, we can take them and show them around. And it's just a really great way to get a, a kind of a intensive snapshot on, on the power of water and eco ecological self-organization in the city. Um, so we really use it a lot for teaching. <coughs> Sorry. So the next, the next couple of things I want to talk about is um, how <clears throat> we're currently working with some uh, forestation projects in Tbilisi and then I'll sort of close with a discussion of our work. Although I might not, I might be, I might have to skip that because I know we're running out of time. Um, might skip that part about the health landscapes. Uh, in any event, <laughs> so you can see this is um, <clears throat> this is an area a little bit north of of the Arsenal Oasis. This was the, in 1965 the um, Agricultural University's test plot in Avchala, which means the evil floodplain. <laughs> or the vicious floodplain. <laughs> um, the Ag University is sort of on the top left, and then at the bottom you can see uh, a collective farm. 
Um, one of my friends found this amazing drawing from the archive. And of course that orientation of, of the plots is to slow down the wind. Um, and this is what it looks like today. So as I mentioned, huge uh, expansion in urbanization um, from the 90s on. So this is kind of a, a sort of high-end suburb, um, that strange building that looks like it has like three dots. That's uh, really small. And most of that collective farm is, um, now it's, I think a number of IDP's families live there, really displaced persons. And then there's an excavation you can see in the bottom left, which is illegal riverbed mining and an area called the Gomi Meadows that um, hopefully we'll be involved in helping to um, rehabilitate. It's another area in the city, this is Barkatili, which means I am kind. Um, this is a early um, micro rayon, basically a neighborhood. And you can see again, those um, very clear hedgerows. That's what it looks like today. So quite a bit of infill. And then you can see that micro rayon that got built. Um, it's basically a whole other small city. And these, these micro rayons got built um, from the 70s up until like the late 80s. And, and the idea was that this, you know, once you got to be a million people, it would get more cool stuff from Moscow. So you always wanted to grow your city. Um, so they would build these micro rayons to do that. You get more metro or you get just more money. Um, this is another forest area in Skeneti, which is just north of where I live. Um, and you can see those really strong patterns. And it's all pines, all one kind of pine, Pinus buccia, which is all dying now. Um, and this is the, <clears throat> the similar planting, Tatsminda, um, it's a Lucky area. And you can see here that in those lines, and those were, um, <coughs> they use dynamite to create those terraces. So, you know, a kind of extreme type of forestry. <laughs> so Nerikala Forest, um, <clears throat> so I might have to close close with this project. This is um, the Narikala, um Fortress, which was one of the ways the city was protected um, through the centuries, uh, is right along as this backdrop to um, Sololaki, which is a really wonderful neighborhood, old Tbilisi. You can see it in these early drawings by uh, Vahushti, um, this steep ridge. And then again, you can see those uh, irrigated areas of Sololaki. It's kind of in a um, slightly decrepit condition on top of the um, on top of the ridge and we're working slowly to get them to maybe adopt some improvements. The monument that you see in the back, that's Mother of Georgia, or at least data. <clears throat> so this is the area that we're now planting. Um, and there will be um, a cableway that connects a couple of business centers that's gonna slice right up over this. Um, and on the left here, you can see um, this very beautiful green uh, Valley is the National Botanical Garden of Georgia. So this project is really cool because it's it's right between um, <clears throat> this beautiful neighborhood of Solaki and bridging over to the National Botanical Garden and then connecting um, to Kajori and the mountains beyond. As I mentioned, originally planted with using dynamite. Um, and these are some of the references that we used in terms of creating uh, patches. To, um, to sort of simulate a natural, a natural forest, um, but also with a very heavy cultural influence um, to make it legible and not just like a random mix and not, you know, a series of lines, but something that is basically a bit more pictorial. <clears throat> we used also references from the um, Alna Landscape Laboratory, which I encourage all of you to visit. Um, in Sweden, this is uh, Roland Gustafsson's project. It's quite amazing. So it's a, a laboratory that's not only about ecology, but also about aesthetics um, and forest um, understory, uh, color, light. So um, <clears throat> we sort of thought about it in a couple ways. There's um, different strata based on the kind of cultural layer, which is that there's this line of you know cedar and cypress. That's a kind of historic uh, marker. 
And then you have these steeper areas where um, you have more um, brutal species. And we're just sort of interplanting into those areas, creating these bands of color. So in the springtime, you have this great blossoming of the cornice, um, followed by the redbud um, and the almond. They all kind of come together in this pink, the pink time. Um, and then in the fall, you would have these nice patches of red from the um, smoke bush and the cotonous which is also really goodness is like everybody's favorite nurse plant um <clears throat> so again we looked at some of the ways that the um, trees stratify themselves naturally um in these conditions the carpinus um the georgian oak um again i mentioned that cornice moss which has that it's called shindy here um it has these beautiful red berries and yellow flowers in the spring um and different types of prunus. Um, and so we concocted these patches um, that have you know, different shapes and textures and randomized, randomized them um, based on a set of rules. We use grasshopper um, to do these distributions because when you have seven hectares and thousands of plants, you can't sort of individually paint them around. It would take all day. So we basically created zones and then we let the algorithm do the work um, <clears throat> of distributing those species. Now, the, the flip side of this, which we're just running into now, is that you, you can't plant like a grasshopper script. Like you have to, guys have to go out and dig holes. <laughs> and sometimes there's rocks. And sometimes there's not enough soil. And we ended up with more plants in our script than they could do holes. So we had to go back and reconcile the two, um, which we've been doing over the past month, which is basically counting the holes, counting up what kind of supply we have at Sartichala, and then now we're ready to actually plant this thing. <clears throat> so this silver forest, um, which is sort of just below this one, the cedar forest, as I mentioned before, is the kind of more cultural signifier of the, the Soviet planting. The silver forest has this beautiful um, Celtis, um, which just yeah has this wonderful sort of fuzzy fuzzy silver leaf. Um, the nushi, which is the almond, um, the taniaster, which would have that also that under like underside of white, um, and then this flowering thicket, which again is the sort of rivers of pink that you'll see in the springtime. Um, we also mixed in a lot of um, we had to mix in a lot of <laughs> crazy cultural species because the person funding this was decommissioning a nursery that he had and we had to integrate all of the plants from that nursery because he was going to develop that site and then the chaparral which is at the lower elevations um which is mostly this um spartium which has a nice um smell in the springtime um the coatness as i mentioned which will turn you know purple and red in the fall um, and then the uh, Quercus petraea. And here's our long list of species. Um, <clears throat> the shrubs and herbaceous layer has been the trickiest for us because the forester doesn't really quite think that way um, about propagating those. So we have to work a little bit more with the botanical garden on elevating this part of the, the project. Although we will have a lot of jasmine, um, jasmine and spartium, but this uh, Atrophaxis cocosica is also a really, really cute, cool plant, um, but nobody can probably figure out how to grow it. Um, anyway, here's that section from the Cartley Stata down to the Bethlehem Church. Um, and then this one showing that flowering thicket. And here's some, here's some renders. <laughs> you gotta get the project approved, right? So. Very, you know, turn up the saturation always. Um, <clears throat> and this is that selfness for it. So, and you can see here that in this view, you can see the kind of urban fabric, um, these wonderful 19th century um, merchant houses and civic buildings and um, Georgian and Armenian Orthodox churches mixed in. There's a, there's a synagogue. Um, a little bit off off screen as well, and then you can see sort of in the distance there's new business centers going in. So it's it's quite an eclectic, quite an eclectic area. 
No, and I think this really shows the nice concentration of the of the different patches um, and how they sort of fit together in the in this different strata. And there it is in the fall. And you can see things as well, like in this view that this crazy person built a, <laughs> a huge concrete wall on this historic on this historic ridge, as well as another a couple other monstrosities in here. So they're finally getting a handle on this sort of idea of like heritage and view shed, but still maybe some time. And this is just that planting plan um, in color with all seven hectares and the different patches. So again, this was done, um, <clears throat> just use uh, Rhino script and distribution to do, to do this and then just counted everything up. So, should I should I stop here and we can do questions or I can just go briefly into this last part, which is a few minutes. What do you think, Dietmar? That's a question for me. I would say, go ahead, Sarah. <laughs> Don't stop. <laughs> I couldn't hear you. So I think this was a question for me, and I tried to tell you, don't stop. Go ahead, Sarah. Don't stop. Can you hear me? Go, go ahead. Show, show. Yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so just a few more minutes. Um, <clears throat> So other part of our research um, is lifelong, I think, which will be um, investigating the, the health landscapes of Soviet Georgia and um, all these different um, ecological conditions that were documented by scientists all through the last century, um, whether it was air quality, mineral waters, um, <clears throat> air currents, that kind of thing. And um, in the Soviet Union, they just built um, hundreds of health resorts and they were either small uh, local ones um, or they would be for like the railway workers union or um, <clears throat> other types of political unions and um, the idea was you know you needed a few weeks off each year and you needed to recuperate and uh, they were trying out all kinds of ways of um, of healing people um, a lot of a lot of the sanatoria were for um, tuberculosis um, obviously before they had uh, drugs to treat that that condition. Um, it was a lot about fresh air and sunshine. Um, but still today, like I, you know, I go to a particular spring um, in Newton AC because it's really good for um, skin conditions. So, you know, if you go to a doctor and they'll say, well, you can put this cream on or you can just go to Newton AC for two weeks and you'll get better. So <laughs> if I can get this to move. Um, and so, you know, all over the country are these wonderful mineral springs, all different tastes, different tastes of water. And Georgia exports a ton of mineral water. Um, different brands have really different flavors. And so you can see the way that, um, especially in the Soviet era, these uh, springs were quite celebrated. And um, many of them <clears throat> in the more vernacular um, uh, springs are dedicated to someone, like a loved one, as a kind of memorial. So you'll see like a portrait of somebody, you'll say like Mono Spring or something like that. Um, mud. Um, this is Achtala, which is um, called, means here mud. <laughs> um, this is an amazing landscape. This, we've been trying to um, be involved with the rehabilitation of this landscape. And there's a, like a trolley that scoops up mud and it, you know, on a cable and it brings it in and it dumps it into some pool and then you sit in it. Um, it's a little bit, um, it's not working right now, but um, hopefully they will get that rejuvenated. Um, <clears throat> these are climactic resorts, high altitude resorts, um, Le Bardet and Bach Maro. Um, these again are really under a lot of development pressure and fortunately they're undergoing some master planning. Um, limiting development, putting people on um, canalization, which is other, otherwise known as sewer systems. Um, and yeah, people just come up to these wonderful cabins in the summer and just breathe fresh air and 
enjoy the climate. <clears throat> Some of these larger resorts will lend um, the idea that this pollen was really good for your lungs. Um, it's coming from the fir trees. Um, this is Iron May, which is also known for its water. Um, I've never been to this one. It looks quite looks quite cool. But also abandoned. Um, Sire May has been redeveloped. Um, hundreds of sanatory for children. Um, children of the Railway Workers Union, for example. Um, so kids, you know, had different uh, lung conditions, uh, digestive conditions would go to these uh, sanatoria stay there for a, a handful of weeks and yeah, take the airs. Um, so one area we've been focusing on and we have a, a friend who's a Fulbright fellow who's really focusing on this area this year. This is the Bordomi Bakuriani Railway. This is a wonderful narrow gauge railway that was built by the uh, by the Russian, the Russians um, at, the, <laughs> at the end of the 19th century. Uh, Eiffel built the bridge here. Um, and it it basically is called it's, it goes from village to village, um, and it would they would pick up you know supplies along the way whether it was cheese and milk, fresh produce and distribute it along this whole corridor from the town of Bordeaux, which also is very famous mineral water. Um, <clears throat> many sanatoria there, and it follows it comes up the Gujarula River and then it crosses a pass onto the other side um, to the Borjuma river side and continues climbing up to Bakuriani, which is a ski area, uh, which has been unfortunately totally overdeveloped. Um, so all along the way, small villages and sanatoria. And um, so our friend is, our friend Sarah Coleman is creating a, a new design, a new trail that will be a kind of interpretive trail that will help link the history the historic sites and the waters. Um, and so she's creating a series of moments, really interesting moments along the trail. And we hope over time that we could do some project that's a kind of ecological art festival, um, <clears throat> some series of installations or activities that would um, basically get to put people on this cute little train and take them up the mountain and they could um, <clears throat> experience different, different landscape moments this is the train, little electric. Absolutely wonderful. Like if any of you are into model trains, this is like a real model train, <laughs> as best as I can describe it. Uh, and there's just wonderful details. Um, we've been in the archives of Georgian Railways and found some of these <clears throat> original drawings, just wonderful rustic treatments of, uh, you know, how little, you know, cattle trails go underneath um, where the trees have started to grow up um, alongside some of the unused lines. And then these are the original drawings um, I found recently. This is Sagberi, which has this amazing, very sour mineral, red mineral, iron rich <laughs> water that's supposed to be really good for your kidneys. Um, absolutely undrinkable. But <laughs> so you can see this wonderful, um, just the absolutely gorgeous sections and plans that they drew. This is the station in Sagberi. So it used to be kind of a big deal. Um, and you can ride it now for like 50 cents. Um, that is, wow, that was Sagberi then. Oh my gosh. <clears throat> this is the spring there with that very red water. Um, <clears throat> this is Libani, um, which is called Nikolaevo. Originally, huge sanatorium that was there. Somebody, I think, is redeveloping it. That's what it looks like today. As you can see, there was a little spring um, in that niche at some point. Um, and I guess that, huh, <laughs> it was missing a few. But anyway, that's, <laughs> I guess that's where it ends. Um, and I hope I can, I can hear you guys if um, there's questions. Can you hear me, Sarah? Maybe I can. Sarah? I don't know why I can't hear you. Hmm. Can, can you hear me? So, can you hear me, Sarah?
maybe the audience can hear me. So everybody in the audience, please feel free maybe to type questions into the chat, maybe. Oh, now I can hear. Oh, you can hear. Because you know, I was asking the audience maybe to type questions into the chat. So mm -hmm. wonderful, Sarah. Normally, you know what we do, we try to be polite and say, oh, it would be so great to have you here in person. In your case, it's exactly the opposite. You know, <laughs> I wouldn't invite you to come to Winnipeg. I would ask you if you would allow us to come to your place. You know, I'm, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't be a problem, you know, to find students joining us, except, you know, we had the pandemic and now we have that war. You know, the next yes. is so, so sad. But other than that, it would be so wonderful you now to join you, to travel with you, and to work with you in your beautiful, do you call it your new home or is it home for you? Yeah, I guess? yeah it's, it's, um, it's my, uh, it's my new home. And hopefully it'll be, we'll be able to stay here. Um, we'll have to see how things go in the next year with, with all that's going on. So again, are, you, are there questions? Please feel free, you know, you can type it in the chat and I can read it or feel free to uh, unmute and uh, turn on your camera for one, two or three questions. Comments? <laughs> That seems to be that seems to be an, an academic silence. Where does this academic <laughs> silence come from? <laughs> I don't know what. Hi, Sarah. Can you can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Fritz. Hi, Sarah. Thank you very much for the presentation. I, I uh, really uh, impressive. Um, what strikes me is that uh, and maybe correct me if I'm wrong, but you work mostly. Uh, from textures and processes, is that true? And less from spatial uh, experiences. They might follow, but that's not your incentive. Is that correct? Oh, could you could you Sorry. maybe explain a bit more what you mean by the spatial? Um, you, you're not setting the stage of saying, look, this is a space with a certain size and, 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 and scale, and then I have a view, and then I have... But you look at the textures that are there, the processes that are going on, and then you start identifying what kind of vegetation there might be, and then the result might be a spatial experience. Is that is that correct? I think I just didn't show those projects. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll get another lecture then. <laughs> yeah, I mean we have we have two or three that um that are much more tightly um, tightly defined. And they're um, there, one is a kind of um, mountain. It's a mountain resort. It's in an uh, artificial lake um, where they're building another another hotel, and so we're kind of fitting things in there. And then another project is a former, another agricultural technical college that was merged with a 19th century um, cognac barons resort that has a beautiful garden. Um, so you have a really you have that like Soviet, they had three trees they can choose. And then you have this, this guy who, you know, had traveled all over Europe and brought back trees and things. And so we're going to integrate those, those two uh, approaches of topography and, and planting. Um, and that project's like it, forever in construction. It's just, and it's being built by um, a family that's the, one of the big road builders in the country. So they promise that they can, build anything in like no time, but they just, they're facing a lot of competition from the Chinese right now. So they haven't had the money to do that project. And the third project is in Signahi where we had to do a huge amount of earthwork. Um, Gabion's retaining walls, um, just huge amount of terraforming and then reconstructing landscape on top of that. And it's just this narrow, narrow ridge with a big hotel on it. So. So those projects that are really, I think, much more um, grading, like focused on earthwork and grading, we, I just, that'll be another lecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. 
please go ahead now it's you know it starts to become more and more private a few of <laughs> us is the, so feel free to ask questions you know don't be shy there yeah <laughs> and if yeah ask me anything ask me like why why did you leave academia <laughs> that 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 would have been my question no nature needs disturbance but you provided some disturbances for your life as well, obviously. Yeah. So why did you leave, you know, all these benefits, you know, you <laughs> could have in the Ivy Tower and to agree to all those risks? I think it's it's amazing, you know. Yeah. It's amazing. I yeah, it's terrifying. Um you know, it was sort of a, a couple of turns of events that um pivoted me back towards this region, but um I had an opening. I was either going to try to try to go into practice in Los Angeles while I held a position as a full-time instructor it was impossible. So um, I knew that wasn't, and I didn't want to go the kind of publishing route. I just, I wanted to build landscapes. I wanted to just put theory into practice finally. Um, and that's a little bit harder to do in the U.S., it's just really, really expensive. And, you know, I don't have a, a very wealthy aunt or partner or, you know, <laughs> and basically this is all just, um, I took my, I took my savings and started this. Um, so that, yeah, it's, it's a slightly better business condition here in that there's no competition, but there's no market either. <laughs> so so we've gotten by on, you know, grants and <clears throat> a couple of a couple of people, you know, found out about us. And um, we do a lot of work for U.S. companies too. We just help out on stuff so that we can maintain um, the fun stuff. Maybe I have to connect you guys again, Fritz and Sarah. Fritz, I'm not real sure if you're aware. Then the touch. They actually, Georgia is very important for them because most of the bulbs, you know, Galantus snowballs are actually imported from Georgia to Dutch traders. The, 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 the flip side is that most of the money stays in the Netherlands. How can we change that, Brits? Any ideas? <laughs> well, at the moment, I have no ideas of money flows in the world. So, uh, uh, yeah. More clever trading from the Georgians, I guess. <laughs> yeah, in Muscari, we have a ton of... Muscari is going to start coming up next week. Um, we have lots of... Right now, we've got a lot of these beautiful, tiny iris. Um, they're just stunning. Um, <clears throat> I forget what their actual name is. We've got the iris and then crocus. Um, and next week will be those little grape hyacinths, Muscari. <laughs> And again, the question call. A few more people are still in the room. Any questions, comments? Maybe I would like to call Vancouver. Is Vancouver still available? Justin? <laughs> Hi, Justin. We can't hear you, Justin. Hi, Sarah. Sorry. Can, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, I I apologize. I got dragged into a meeting, so I, I missed the like first half of your your presentation. But yeah, so so apologies that I, I don't have a, a a quality question for you at this point. Um, yeah, may, maybe just expanding into this this idea of of of, of creating a, a market for where you are. Like, are you looking to to governments? Are you looking to private invest? Like, wh where where are you finding the opportunities? Maybe. A it's a question. mix. Um, George is, you know, it's one of those cultures that like you just have to be there and you've got to be a friend of somebody and that guy's got a project and, you know, you you just sort of have to show up and be, <clears throat> you got to be legit. <laughs> so there's the kind of like network that was really hard, that's really hard to build when there's COVID, um, when there's a pandemic. Um, and I I think one thing I did that was smart is I hired I hired a business manager um, immediately <laughs> because I like this PAC system is actually really much easier than the U.S. But 
I just wanted somebody to like handle that for me because I would always put it off. Um, <clears throat> and so he's helped us connect, helped us connect with the forestry project. That whole Tatsaminda project will be going on for four years. The other government procurement or donor bank project is complicated. You know, it's a tendering system. You know, we had to get to a point where we had enough turnover um, to qualify. And then like recently, like we had a funny inversion where we applied for a project in urban design where we were the lead and Arab was the sub consultant. <laughs> Doesn't make any sense at all, but um, <clears throat> that's how like uh, ADB projects are, um, are kind of going through where they want to, they really want to support the local, the smaller local businesses or women run businesses. Um, and then some private landowners um, have come to us um, through various channels. There's a few, like we have a few high-end residential projects that people who are just like super into plants, you know, and have really interesting sites um, who want to do something really long-term. But in general, it's, you know, this is a, rapidly developing place. People don't know what landscape architecture is. They don't know why they should spend any money. Um, they just they can, like plan it out and make a slope. <laughs> and um, maybe maybe those problems are universal because I, I still have that issue in Vancouver. So <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it's like this is no surprise. So I mean as I mentioned, like we do a lot of support for American companies in terms of like we <clears throat> We do concept work and production um, in order to just keep the money flowing in because you know we we sort of fine tuned it because we thought we would do, be doing a lot more work here, like really focus on growing the the region. But as you know, like things have gotten really strange really quickly. <laughs> so we just you know pivoted, like you know, a kind of a month ago in anticipation of things getting things getting weird, um, you know, with a huge drop in um, tourism that's going to happen, uh, people aren't investing. So, so that's, so that's going up, <laughs> but also like the Ministry of Environment is interested in, they're getting money, you know, from different organizations. Like we, we go in on a lot of grants with like bird, right. bird people or like river people or, uh, you know, other groups like that, because we can do a lot with, um, some of our technology, you know, just to, um, and we, if we're working with Heidelberg Cement at the Quarry Life Award, um, which is a really cool project that happens every couple of years. And um, they're like, we're doing some, ex some experiments and like modeling for them for um, how they excavate, you know, they're not allowed to do this anywhere, but like Georgia, <laughs> excavate riverbeds for uh, aggregate. Um, for concrete, and um, that's absolutely terrible for fish mm. that are spawning, that are coming up from the Caspian. So we were trying to get them to do that in a different way that, like, maybe creates more edge. Um, <clears throat> we just started on that project, but you know, that's like a little bit of money, um, enough to get down there, fly the drone, and like have some students, you know, do some modeling and stuff. So. So yeah, it's um you know it's like the dream job. <laughs> like, it, there's just enough margin because the cost of living is low enough that we can do um, we can do our research and but at the same time yeah we have to you know pay the bills. So. Bread and butter, yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Yeah.